Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Overcoming seasons of crisis. Everybody say it with me. Overcoming seasons of crisis. Say it loud. No, a little louder. All the way in the back. Say it loud. When you say it again, I want you to say seasons real loud. Say it. Overcoming one more time. Overcoming seasons of crisis. We're going to focus on understanding the keys to overcoming times of stress. Understanding how to rise above a crisis. Everybody say seasons of crisis. This is very important. Please take notes today, please. Everybody say seasons of crisis. When the leaves change on the trees and they fall off and the weather changes its temperature, everyone knows a season is coming. I want you to remember what you're about to hear because this will keep you very peaceful. There is a benefit to seasons. Please write this down. Nothing is permanent except God and his promises. Say that with me. Say it loud. Say it to your neighbor. Say it to your other neighbor on the other side. Come on, look at me in the face. Nothing is permanent except God and his promises. Now say it to yourself. Nothing is permanent except God and his promises. You better give God thanks for that statement. Number two, this is very important. God promises that nothing is permanent. God promised that. And that's a good thing to remember right now. Number three. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 makes this statement in verse 1. It says, to everything there is a season and there is a time for every purpose under heaven. Say it aloud with me. To everything there is a season. Say it again. To everything there is a season. Say it again. To everything there is a season. God says everything only has a season. Nothing is permanent except God and his promise. Now here's something about this statement. That statement is a promise. God is promising you that whatever you are going through is only a season. You ought to give him a big hand for that. But that's a poor hand. I'd have been shouting the way I feel. You see, you don't understand what he's saying. What he's saying is, it doesn't matter what's happening. It can't last. Oh, I heard from God today. Listen to me. Watch this. Seasons got power. Here's the power of seasons. Number one, seasons guarantee change. Say it. One more time. Seasons, God says everything has a season, which means that it doesn't matter what you are experiencing, whether it's good or, in your opinion, bad, it will change. Number two, seasons gives hope. No matter how cold it gets in the winter, summer is coming. You know, when winter comes, you don't throw away your swim trunks. You don't sell all your linen clothing, do you? What do you do? You store them up. Why? You wait. Why are you waiting if it's winter? How come you got hope to keep your clothes? Listen, don't close your bank account out 
Leave some money to keep it open. Why? The season coming. A lot of money is on the way. Keep the account open. Don't shut it down. It's only a season. Tell your neighbor, you only broke for a season. Now you all go with me. Shout the say amen now. If I don't feel you, coming to slap you. Say it. Everything is seasonal. Don't throw your, your, your clothes away. Don't let nobody make you throw your hope away. Write this down. Number three. Nothing remains the same. Say it. This is important. Summer doesn't stay. Winter never stays. Autumn never stays. Spring never stays. And God says to everything, there's a season. Unemployment is seasonal. Oh, Jesus, I'm mercy. If you are unemployed, then employment is up ahead. Clap, 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 clap. Y'all looking at me like this. Just, the word of God says everything has a season. In other words, the season for you to leave the job you are on has come. Why? There's a better one up ahead. He got to prepare you for that. So he got to close out one chapter to open a bigger chapter. Get ready for something big, 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 bigger than what you had. You ought to give God praise. That's the promise. Yeah. Write this down. This is important. Seasons are always temporary. Say it. Crisis is not a permanent condition. And crisis is a human description. God has no crisis. It's just a season. And the key to life is outlasting the season. Say that with me. The key to life is outlasting the season. If you can stay warm long enough, summer will come. What you have to do is organize yourself to outlast the season. That's all. It cannot stay. That's why seasons give hope. You don't quit permanently in a season. As a matter of fact, write this statement down. This one got me going last night. Seasons give the incentive to plan for the future. You know, the best time to shop for winter clothes is in the summer. Now, why are you buying mink in summer? People may laugh at you, but they don't understand. You are aware that summer is a season. Hello? So what you got to do is plan for the next phase. Seasons gives the incentive to plan. This won't last. Let me get ready for what's coming. Let my expectation be based on the fact that seasons don't last. That's why kingdom people live in faith. Their faith is what I'm going through cannot last. That's very important. Next, seasons are always moving. Tell your neighbor, it's moving. So you stay still. You know, we panic too quickly. We throw up our hands too quickly. And God says, no, I like, the way, I like the way God speaks to the children of Israel. He says, stand still and see. In other words, Pharaoh, they're moving. You just stand still and what? See the salvation of the Lord. You can't see the salvation unless you stand steady. He will save you, not from the storm, but in the storm, through the storm. I was speaking to a hotel group this last couple of days, and I was telling them, I was over at Atlantis actually, speaking to all their managers, over 2,000 of them. And I said, look, let me tell you something, relax, why? Because one thing with hurricanes, they move it. Now, here's the problem with hurricanes though. Sometimes the, 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 the weatherman will say, it's moving 15 miles per hour. So you got to calculate how long it would take to pass my house. Now, heaven help you if he said moving two miles per hour. 
You all know what I'm talking about, right? That means they're going to stay over for a little while. Well, I got news for you. Whatever is coming, it came to pass. Hey, neighbor, we are durable. We are stronger than the wind. We are built on a rock. The foundation of Christ. You know why they call him the rock of ages? Because all the ages keep passing. Come on, clap your hands, man. That's, that's, that's why they call him the rock of what? Ages. If it's the age of brokenness, that passed. The age of plenty, that passed. The age of submission, that passed. The age of confusion, that passed. The age of crisis, that passed. The rock is steady. Write this down. Never respond permanently to a temporary problem. Never respond permanently to a temporary problem. Your life is never finished. So don't throw your hands up and say, that's it. It's over. I ain't never going to make it. You're trying to make a permanent condition out of a temporary experience. Hey, winter's coming. Let's throw away all of our summer clothes. That's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. The Bible says, keep your faith. This is why we have faith in God. Because God is stable. Everything else changes. Therefore, everything moves in seasons. Here's a verse you need to remember. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 4. There's a time to weep. That's a season. And then there's a time to laugh. That's a season. Now, if you're laughing now, don't worry. Praise the Lord. There's going to be something that shows up to make you weep a little bit. But then when you weep, don't worry. Laughter coming again. Tell your neighbor, you're going to laugh again. Say it loud. You're going to laugh again. In other words, laughter only goes under weeping. Wait till weeping finish, then laugh will come back. Look at the next statement. It says, a time to mourn. And there's a time to dance. These are seasons. Now here's one that really blew my mind. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 6 says, there's a time to what? Get. Oh boy, plenty, 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 plenty. Then there's a time to lose. Oh, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. These are seasons. Let me tell you something. Evidence of God's blessing is not measured by you having things. Well, I broke. I must have did something wrong. No, 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 no. You're nothing wrong. That's just a season. You see, the Bible says there's no temptation or test that comes against you that's not common to all men. And then it says the trying of your faith. Work in patience. God allows the seasons to come to test your faith. Faith simply means belief. Do you believe God when you have nothing? Good. Then he, then he makes sure you have nothing for a while to see if you really believe. There's a time to what? Get. And there's a time to lose. That's what the Bible says. Some people walk around saying, well, you know, I ain't got nothing. And maybe I'm sinning. You ain't sinning. That's a broke season. And the Bible says, keep your faith in the middle of that season. It's your faith that you're supposed to live by, not your money. Or you're plenty. You shall live by what? Faith. What kind of faith do we have? We only got faith for getting, not faith for losing. Look at the last line. A time to what? Keep and a time to cast away. You could apply that to a thousand things. There's some friends who you're keeping right now, keeping some company. The time will come when you got to get rid of those company. Because they're speaking negative now. You have outgrown them. Hello. There are some people who went into the crisis with you. They ain't coming out with you because they won't stay. You need to get out of that situation, get in the right atmosphere, and keep your attitude right, and you might have to change your friends. There's a time to keep, and there's a time to cast away. Maybe you have a piece of property, and you was keeping it for all these years, and now God says, okay, tell you what, let's cast it away now. You, you, you can get a bigger piece later, but right now, I want you to convert that into liquid cash. 
there's a time to keep and then there's a season to cast away here's something that blew my mind Genesis 8 God is speaking God says in verse 22 as long as the earth remains is the earth still here is the earth still here hit your neighbor tell your neighbor we still here hit him again say we still here hit him hard tell him we still here all right now tell your neighbor read up with me come on say it. read up with me hey buddy let's go together read as long as the earth endures seed time and harvest cold and heat summer and winter day and night will never cease and that's my case some of you are in night right now. God says, listen, that's part of it. But after every night, there's what? Day. Some of you are in the midst of summer right now. Things going good. But there will be a winter period. And he says, this will happen as long as the earth remains. So kingdom people don't worry. They are seasonal people. They handle the seasons and never waver because they know that they are steady, not the season. And so no matter what people call the environment, what's going on, that doesn't bother us because our faith is steady. We are focused on the rock. The rock that is the cornerstone that never moves. Very important. Look at Ezekiel 34. Everybody read. Go. Verse 26. I will bless them and the places surrounding my hill I will send down showers in season there will be showers of blessing now showers of blessing is able to come in seasons so when the blessings start coming uh, you know that is not a permanent condition is your faith still in God when the showers stop I will send them blessings in seasons. You know, when I first read a verse, I was a little teenager when I read this verse. You know, my father sitting here today, they taught us how to read the Bible. One of the first chapters that they made us memorize. I don't know if my dad even remember this. You know, dad, you, 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 you made us memorize a verse when I was a little kid. The verse was Psalm 1. I never forgot it. It says, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, for his delight is in the law, and in his law shall he meditate day and night. And then it says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in its season. There's a season when there ain't no fruit. You're working hard, you ain't see the results. You're working hard, you say, God says that's part of the season. It brings forth its fruit where? In its season. It says the leaves also shall not wither. Now, you don't eat the leaves. The leaves are a sign that the tree is still alive. But there ain't no fruit. In other words, my faith is still grounded. My roots are still in the, by, by, by the water of life. I'm still alive, but right now I ain't bearing no fruit. I'm just working hard. I'm planning hard. I'm thinking hard. But I promise you, there'll be a season when I can feed everybody. Give God a hand that you are a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bring up for the food in the season. Your leaves also shall not wither, and whatsoever you do shall prosper. He said, bless you in seasons. Write this down. A crisis is an event over which we have no control. We have no control of what's happening in the world right now. I'm talking about nobody has control over it. All the G7 nation, they call it now the, the G28. Yeah, they're meeting in, in Washington. They still don't know what to do. Why? Because something is happening, no one can control. That's why they call it a crisis. A crisis is anything that happens that you cannot control or you didn't cause. So those of you who were laid off your jobs, don't blame nobody because no one could explain that. Don't try to find someone to attack and, and say, you know, the management or, or, or the company. Nothing to do with that. Everybody is a victim of what they call a crisis. What's a crisis? Say it out loud. What's a crisis? 
an event over which you have no control. So here's the second statement. This is important. We are always in control of our thoughts. So we can have a new perspective of what's happening, even though we don't understand it. We can interpret it. And that's why this teaching is so important. You can look at it and say, no matter what it is, it cannot last. Why? Because I understand from my kingdom perspective, this is only a season. You can have hope in the middle of winter because you are convinced that summer is coming. That's what keeps your spirit peaceful. You know what makes people commit suicide? When they believe that the season is permanent. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Don't throw your arms up. Don't despair. Don't be anxious for anything, the Bible says. Why? Because everything is seasonal. Number three, crises have always been the source of growth and development. This is the time where you are destined to grow and develop. You never change until you have to. Have you noticed that? You've smoking all these years. The doctor say, you know something? You got three weeks to live if you don't start smoking. All of a sudden, you start smoking. You was trying to stop for a thousand years. All of a sudden, he said, look, you can be dead in three weeks. I mean, all of a sudden, you change. Doctor said, okay. You know, your arteries clogged up, and if you don't stop eating cheesecake and macaroni and potato salad on the same plate, you are dead in three weeks. All of a sudden, you start eating raw carrots. In other words, sometimes crisis is the only way we change our behavior. Tell your neighbor, get ready to change, get ready to change, get ready to change, get ready to change. Ready to change. We're going through a period in the world where God's going to bring massive development. You know, one thing I like about hurricanes, hurricanes are God's way of cleaning up a country. Them old trees that look good. Rotten on the inside, hurricane passed through, crack everything on the ground. And the place looked like a mess. But if you stay around for the next five months, you see new trees coming up, new flowers, new buds. Why? Because a hurricane gets rid of all the stuff that's faking it, including the houses that ain't built right. Oh, come on now, let's talk about that, huh? Hurricane had to shake those who violate the building code. Come on, give him a praise anyhow. There's some folks who are walking around looking good. Yeah? Christ is going to get you now. Bomb. Let me see what kind of faith you have. Well, praise the Lord. God is good. Oh, yeah? Let's see how good he is. Wow! Here comes the crisis. It cleans out all the fakers. Don't look now. You're sitting in front of one of them. See? It's amazing. <laughs> oh, they can praise the Lord, dance and shout. But when the trouble comes, hey, where's God? Where's God? What do you mean, where's God? You told me, my God shall supply. Tell your neighbor, rejoice in the furnace. Say it loud, rejoice in the furnace. Scream it loud, say rejoice in the furnace. Come on, John, say it, rejoice in the furnace. Say it loud, say rejoice in the furnace. Listen, you don't wait till you come out to shout. Crisis always forces development. This is the fourth point. Crisis creates opportunity for creativity. You will have to invent new ways to deal with old problems when crisis comes. And that's what's happening right now. In Washington, D.C., this past week, 20 heads of nations were meeting in Washington with President Bush. And do you know what they're doing? Exactly what I wrote here. They are trying to find new ways to deal with a new situation they ain't never seen before. They got to invent a new economic system, they said. Why? Because crisis shakes the foundations of what you thought was traditionally sound. That means you got to find new ways to make money in the Bahamas. I'm so glad for this crisis because our country will never diversify until we lose tourism. Please don't, don't get mad at me now. All that seafood we got in the ocean, if we don't develop that, some Chinaman can come here with some ships and take our seafood back to China to feed them billion people. I'm giving you a good advice. You're laughing. 
If you don't develop Andrews, some channel can come here with $2 billion. They can give you all a stadium to fool you all, but they really after Andrews. Why? They got to feed a billion people. And you got good soil, and that grows 12 months out of the year. That's the kind of soil they want. And we can sit right here on another hog island, we'll turn into paradise, and we're going to be slaves. Crisis creates creativity. We got to be creative. When the leader of your country speaks for an hour and ain't saying nothing, we need some new creative thinkers around here. Come on, clap. Don't look at me funny. I live here. I watch it. I say, you know, something ain't right here. Talk to me about something new. The king of birds is the eagle. And the eagle has seven wingspans, seven feet wide. When an eagle is full grown, seven feet wide span. But when they're born, they're born in a small little egg. Massive birds. And the only way an eagle learns to fly is when the male takes the little eaglet on his wing and he flies five miles in the air and then he <laughs> closes his wing and then brothers start falling. <laughs> now, you got two things to do. <laughs> die or fly. Say it. Die. One more time. Say die or fly. Hit your neighbor and say, you better die or fly. In other words, God will close his wing on the country. <laughs> you all better fly or you'll die. Come with a new way to flap. <laughs> yeah, God got a way to make it creative. <laughs> Write this down, please. The Japanese. Write this down. It's very important. You know why Asians always succeed wherever they go? I couldn't believe it, you know. In Bain Town, Augusta Street, in the middle of the ghetto was a Chinaman store. And we had to go there and buy rice and lard. You remember lard? Yeah. <laughs> we used to buy it by the pound in a white piece of paper, lard. I'm trying to figure out why I'm still alive today. Eh? I got lard all in my lungs. <laughs> but that, those Chinese land in the middle of black neighborhood Bam! when they land business do you know why a chinaman and asian always makes it because in chinese and japanese there's no word for crisis it's not in the vocabulary matter of fact the word for crisis in japanese and chinese is the word opportunity say it Say it again. So when a Chinaman house burned down, you say, oh, oh, big opportunity, 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 opportunity. For him to say, my God, trouble. <laughs> Chinaman, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. <laughs> when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, World War II, they obliterated Japan, destroyed Hundreds of thousands of people in one minute. The city was leveled, turned to rubble. The Japanese says, ah, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. And they came out of the dust of that bomb and became the number one exporters of Toyota cars, Mitsubishi cars, Hachitachi cars. Yaka Yaki cars, Suzuki motorbikes, they sell you the radio, the TV, and the CDs. What? And America became so afraid of them. America says, stop exporting to us. You are imbalancing the trade balance. Read my lips, please. Japan is an island. When I went to Japan, I got mad. When we landed, I see you know something? This island? This is like Andrews. They rule the world in cars. And here we are, begging people to get some money. Little porridge, as if we are just beggars in our islands. It's how you think. Out of the crisis came creativity. 
I want you right now, from this day forward, this is my command in the name of Jesus. From now on, when you leave this room, when you walk out of this room, everybody you meet in the hallway, in the parking lot, all week, all next week, beginning today, when you see them and they ask you, how you doing? They tell them, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Come on, say it. Opportunity. 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 Say it. Opportunity. Say it. When they say, we got to lay you off, what are you going to say? Opportunity. Opportunity. Start my own business. Start my own business. Start my own business. Clap, 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 clap. That's why Chinamen don't work for nobody. Every problem they see, opportunity. The Chinese know that black people like Greece. Oh, I can talk about it. You might as well get ready for this. So they know how to put that grease in that rice. Bam! That grease in that mayo bubu chicken. Bam! <laughs> look at your face. You all look guilty. And they put the restaurant right in the middle of the ghetto. Bam! <laughs> Everybody's opportunity. Opportunity. And you sit right there and don't open no restaurant. Yeah, and then rice don't last when you eat them, but they, they give it to you. They got it worked out. You keep coming back for more. Tell your neighbor, opportunity. Say the opportunity. That's going to be our statement for the rest of the year, okay? All the way through Christmas. Everybody can say what? Opportunity. opportunity. That's right. No matter what happens, everybody can say opportunity. Why? Because we are kingdom people. We see solution in every problem. The Bahamas and Africa and South America and Italy and Haiti ain't going down. We are going up. Come on, clap if you believe it. Say hallelujah. This is the time to go where? Up. up. Everybody's opportunity. Up. Opportunity. Up. Opportunity. Up. Opportunity. Up. Say it again. Opportunity. Up. Ain't no crisis in the Japanese mind. Whatever you call a thing, that's what it is. Write that down, please. Whatever you call it, that's what it is. If you call it opportunity, then you start taking advantage of it. Very important. So to a Japanese, every problem is a business. This is the time for you who, you, who have been set free from a job. Let me say it again, you all missed that. This is the time for those of you who have been set free from the cage to go hunting for problems. Why? Say it out loud. Every problem is a business. I asked the Lord today, how am I supposed to close this sermon? He said, I want you to do something specific. So I'm going to show you in a few minutes what he told me to do. Write this down. The effects of crisis. I want you to know, they, know what they are so they won't happen to you, okay? When crisis comes, they produce fear. Trauma, depression, despair, frustration, anxiety, a sense of loneliness, abandonment, worry, hopelessness, sense of loss, sense of death, sense of survival, abuse, crime, and domestic violence. Now that's a problem for a country. And that's what crisis does in humans. And that's what's happening all over the world right now. That list describes what's happening to people except you. Because you are not under the world system. People are anxious, they're afraid. They are lonely. They feel like they're the only one having problems. Got to watch that spirit. And that can destroy people's lives and make them make permanent decisions in a temporary environment. The Bible says be anxious for nothing. But in all things you must pray. And never stop praying. And then it says, rejoice. Why? Because winter is only temporary. Don't throw off your confidence, Paul says. Because he who began a good work in you, he will finish it. This is only a season. 
You know, one of the things I've been teaching you all the last few months on faith, one of the things that, I mean, I wrote it in my, in my, uh, in my computer, you know, it comes up on my screen. Just remind myself, there's life after the test. Say it. Yeah, man, there's life after all of this stuff. Don't throw your confidence away. It's very important. Buy the CD, praise the Lord. John 16, verse 33. Read. I have, come on, together. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Okay? In this world, you will have many troubles. That's the promise of Jesus. He says, but take heart. Why? I've overcome the world. What a kingdom attitude. You will have many troubles. He said that's normal for kingdom life. But we are stronger than the troubles, he says. We overcome them. I've overcome them. I've shown you how to overcome. You follow me. Look at the next verse. John, 1 John 5 verse 4. Read it loud, please. Go. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He says, you overcome by your faith. You know what faith is? Faith is believing in the dark what he told you in the light. Amen. Can I say it again? Please get the CD. Faith is what? Believing in the dark what he told you in the light. You believe in winter that summer is on the way. That's faith. Therefore, you are not despairing in the middle of winter because you know that he promised Summer is coming. This is only a season. That's how you overcome the world. Notice Jesus said up, up in John. He says there will be many troubles. Troubles are always moving. They are temporary. They are seasonal. He says so you overcome them by your belief, your faith. I will come through this. This cannot last. And I was thinking, people get divorced. Please don't take it personal, okay? Unless it's for you. But people get divorced sometimes too quickly. Because they forget that, that their spouses go temporarily insane. I'm serious about that. There's some folks who do some dumb things temporarily. And if you make a permanent decision on a temporary experience, you could lose out. Suppose my wife divorced me 20 years ago. She had been divorcing a guy who was a multi-million... <laughs> best-selling author come on talk to me matter of fact I want you to if you're married I want you to, I want you to tell your spouse right now you might as well get used to me because I ain't going nowhere just in case you become a multi-millionaire clap 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 just you don't know what's up ahead in their lives you never know who you are living with never know you see p p people go through insanity seasons <laughs> that woman do some dumb things I'm gonna leave her don't leave her don't leave her she insane temporarily <laughs> that man off gone now you know there's some situations that's really rough you know some of these things you know sometimes uh, things can be so bad though that this ain't no season. This person completely crazy forever. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta let them go. But there are many conditions where you know it ain't worth giving up. Temporary comfort. That's what we want. That's why we want to get out fast. I want temporary comfort. Now the Bible did say there's a time to gather, and there's a time to scatter. Some folks are so insane, they've gone too far. You've got to scatter them. Go. If they want to hurt you physically, go, go, go. If they don't want to change, go, 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 go. Yes, let, me, let me give you some, some, some important wisdom here. When I was a teenager, I read this back. It's interesting. And I, it blew my mind. It says, God loves the world. Then it says, God loves is long suffering and I read that and it hit me it didn't say God's love is forever suffering it's just long 
through suffering. Suffering means allow, to allow. In other words, there comes a time when the long ran out. Now go, 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 go. Are you with me? Yeah, there's some people who you, you know, you can give them a long rope. They say, okay, you know, I would allow this. I'll, I'll put up with this. But there comes a point where even the love of God runs out. And then judgment takes over. That's why you will be judged. God will put up with you and tolerate you for a long time. And then after a while he realizes, that, you know, hey, you're just abusing his grace. He says he making an apostate. He turned you over to the devil. But some things are seasons. So don't give up in a season. Write this down, please. Very important. This one here is important here. The word world is the word cosmos in Greek. Jesus used this word. It means governing systems. It means personal power of control. It also means systems of influence. In other words, the economies of the world, the cultures of the world. He says, you have overcome the system. Now, right now, the system ain't working too well. Yes? Banks are collapsing. Insurance companies folding up. Oil prices fluctuating. Economy going crazy. Businesses downsizing. Some going belly up. I mean, you know, you got major companies falling apart. The system ain't working. He says, well, I have overcome the cosmos. And how do you overcome the cosmos? He says, you overcome by your faith. You will overcome the system. And our government simply has a system. Our economy is a system. That's the world. That's the word world means. It means the system that, that controls. He says, you will overcome that system. And that's encouraging to me. And so he says, look, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes, Jesus says? Don't worry about those things. And then he goes on to say in verse 33, he says, you don't be like the pagans because pagans worry about those things. They get anxious and fearful and depressed and I want you to leave this building today knowing that you are not one of them. You are not a pagan. You are a peaceful person. You are confident that the season will pass and that there is a better time coming up ahead and your fate will make it through the storm. Nothing can stop what God promised you. He says only pagans worry about things. He said, but your heavenly father, what? Knows what you need. But therefore you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough problem of its own he wants you to be peaceful confident that the season will change I dropped this on you here James 2 14 says what now uh, everybody say faith works okay this is where I want to close up when I you know uh, the next time we the next session I'm going to take this into a deep practical side but I want you to see something Everybody say faith. faith. How do we overcome? By our faith. How do we overcome? Okay. What is faith? It's the word pistis in Greek. It means to believe. So we still believe in the middle of the crisis. We believe that God will bring us out. God will do what he says. We believe. Okay. Everybody say faith. faith. Help me Lord to explain this please. Help me Holy Ghost. Okay. Everybody say faith. Okay, so everybody was shouting just now when they're talking about faith. Praise the Lord, brother man, praise the Lord. But then, in the middle of the storm, he say, wake. Look at this. It says, faith must have work. You work in the middle of the tough time. You don't overcome just by faith. Read verse 14, James 2. Read. What does it profit, my brother, if someone says, I have faith, but does not have works? Can faith save you in the crisis? No. Look at the next verse. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have work, is dead. Everybody say work. 
This is the time to get to work while you're waiting on the next season. Apparently, God knows that in the middle of a crisis is the greatest time to work. But you got to work from a different perspective. As a matter of fact, he says, but someone will say, I have faith and I have work. Show me your faith, James says, without your works, and I will show you a faith by works. If you believe that God will bring you through, he says, work while you're waiting. Do something. Tell your neighbor, do something. Say it again, do something. That means there's always something to do. You know, when crisis comes, it creates unity. Hey, all right, me and you live in the same apartment, right? I live upstairs, you live downstairs, and we don't speak to each other, we don't like each other, okay? We have bad attitude toward each other. All of a sudden, the apartment starts burning down. So I grab a bucket, you grab a bucket. We don't speak now, we hate each other now, but our house is about to go up in flames. What happens after that? We start working together. You get the water, I'll hold the bucket. See, crisis turns enemies into friends. When the boat's sinking, everybody's that bailing. Now, we don't speak to each other before that now. Crisis creates unity. Number two, write this down. Crisis creates community. When people are in trouble, they have to get along. That's why God allows crisis to bring love back into situations. Thirdly, crisis produces empathy. Sometimes you've been doing so well for so long, you don't know how to feel to hurt no more. And you become so heartless toward people who are hurting that God will allow you to lose some stuff so you can be reminded where you came from and then you start liking people again. Give God a hand for that. See, crisis can bring you back down to humanity. And sometimes God needs to make you lose everything to feel what those who have nothing feel like again so you can love them and help them. Empathy. Crisis also produces a sense of solidarity. We work together. You know, we've been telling you to bring a can of, of goods every single Sunday, put on this podium. We keep telling you, keep bringing it, keep bringing it. Why? Because when the crisis hit, we work together as a community. Now, some of you ain't getting the message here. You have to understand that when we all in trouble, we all got to help. And that's what crisis does. It also produces Humanity, it makes you human again. It helps you to realize that you muck and muck with your nice car, now you lose your car and your house going in, in foreclosure. You're back in an apartment, now you become nice to people who are in apartments. Crisis can bring you back to humanity, give you back your sensitivity. And that's why it's important, it makes you simple again. You know, this is no time for you to go buy you no know, iPod. You need food. Simple life. You, you don't got to sit down what kind of iPod I want. That, 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 in crisis, you don't think but that. Brother John, sorry about that. But you know, <laughs> as, as the apple fell over there. Yeah. You know, you, you have to deal with the simplicity of life when crisis comes. It makes you spiritual as well. All of a sudden, everybody won't go to church when trouble comes. That's why God allows trouble. So you come back and worship. And some folks have two jobs, miss church all the time. Bam, two jobs gone. They show up in church, sitting right in the back there, praise the Lord. Jesus, oh Jesus. See, you're back to spirituality again. Crisis brings you back to spirituality. The Bible says many times, God says, when I take you to the land and you prosper, do not forget the Lord, he says. At least I will drive you from the land again. And God's doing that. You watch, in the next few months, church is going to be packed, standing, watch, you watch. They can be standing all against the wall. Why? Because when Christ hit, we're God, God, God. Atheists start saying, Lord, I love you. <laughs> Crisis. It also makes you friendly with people. You know, some folks that walk right here, the nose in the air, walk right past you. <laughs> now they got a job. How you doing, man? How you doing? <laughs> See? They're friendly all of a sudden. Crisis bring you right back to friendship. Tell your neighbor, let's be friends while I got something. <laughs> so when I got nothing, you can you know, come a little bit of something, you know? <laughs> That's what crisis does. It works good stuff. 
It makes you peaceful. It makes you friendly. It makes you spiritual. It brings you back to sensitivity, empathy. Write this one down. It also makes you think of the common good. And finally, it reprioritizes your life. It makes you understand what's important again. What are the real basic things that are important? Crisis brings you back to the simplicity of life. Prosperity is dangerous in the sense that it can make you forget the source of it. And that's God. God will back off so you can come back to him. He'll pull his hands back so you can come back looking for his hands again. He knows how to allow you to experience night so you can appreciate day again. I'm not despairing. I'm excited. God's going to benefit from this crisis through his grace in our lives. Write this down. True leadership is tested in crisis. Crisis is the incubator for leadership development. That's why you, you can become a better person. Crisis is the source of growth and development. Crisis places demands on your hidden potential. Crisis reveals your true beliefs and your convictions. As a matter of fact, crisis tests your faith. And this is why this morning is so important. God is saying, look, I want you to hold steady in the middle of the season. Your faith will not fail. Your faith is stronger than the test and your faith will overcome the test. We overcome the world by our faith and our work. You must work in the middle of the test. You're writing too slow. A crisis on earth is an incident in heaven. When the Lord told me this, I almost danced around the room. Let's say it together. A crisis on earth is an incident in heaven. You call it a terrible experience. God said, that's just a little blimp on my scale. It's an incident. So don't panic. Here's something I think will help you. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 2 says what? The rich man and the poor man have one thing in common. God made them both. Now when I first read that verse, I was living in Bain Town. And my dad, you tell you, you know, we, we were living in an area, we didn't even know we was poor, because everybody around us was, you know, living the same way. But when, I, but when, when I read that, I got angry at God. I almost cursed God when I read that. Because I was a young man, reading that verse, and it says, the rich and the poor have one thing in common, God made them both. That, to me, meant that God made rich people, and God made poor people. The problem was, I was the poor one. So I became angry at God because he didn't make me one of the rich ones. Until I read the rest of the verse. It says, the rich and the poor have one thing in common. God made them both. And God gave sight to both. Now the last part blew my mind. When I did the research on this verse, here's the way it's written in the original Hebrew. God makes people. Some become rich, some become poor based on how they see. Let me say it again. God makes people. That's what he makes people. Some become rich, some become poor depending on how they see. So poverty is a product of how you see life. And riches, riches is a product of how you see life. I remember this true story of two young men who used to go to California, University of Southern California. And during the summer, they decided to go on a summer break and visit India. And both of them went to India, and they put their backpack on, they cut off jeans, and they, you know, saved enough money to go to India. And they went to Bombay and Calcutta on these trains, I mean, these two young guys out of college, and they spent the whole summer in India. And they were riding all through those cities. They saw millions of poor people sleeping in the streets in mud and under cardboard boxes. I mean, you know, in India, it was filthy. And these guys were overwhelmed. And one morning, they were living in a hostel. And the guy opened the window, looked out on the porch, the second floor, and he saw, as far as his eyes can see, Indians in poverty. Barefooted, bareback, kids with no clothes on, living in the mud, flies crawling all over the people. They were sleeping under boxes and tin and under the bridges. And the guy was so overwhelmed with it. He says, man, he started crying. He says, gosh, man, look at the poor people. And they don't have any shoes on, no clothes, man. And his buddy came to the window. He said, yeah, man, wow, what a shoe business.
And that's all he said. They went back home, went back to college. They were both in the same class. They were both studying accounts and administration. And one of the guys sat in the class, and for a whole two weeks, he couldn't get the picture of his mind. He saw all those bare feet. And he started sketching on a piece of paper in the class a pair of shoes. And he designed a pair of shoes sitting in the class. And he became so possessed by the idea, he decided to leave school and go and develop the shoe. And his friend says, are you crazy? You better stay in school, get a job, so you can you know, make some money and make a living. The guy says, no, man, I got this idea. I see this thing, man. I see we can provide shoes for those people. And he got a designer to design a shoe for him. He made a prototype. He, he was able to get it tested. And the, the company that made the prototype said that they could produce a shoe for 15 cents. Plastic shoe. So he went to his friend, his, his, his brother's friend. He says, look, you got some money. I'd like for you to invest in this idea I got. I want to sell shoes to India. The guy said, you got a market? He said, man, I got millions of people. I got a big market in India. He said, we can sell this shoe. We can make it 15 cents. We can sell it for 50 cents. And we can ship it over there. And we can get the shoe business going. And the guy believed in this idea. Everybody say idea. idea. Say it again, idea. idea. The guy saw this vision. Within 12 months, they were producing over 3 million pairs of shoes, shipping it over to India, selling them for 50 cents, 55 cents. The guy became a multi-millionaire in one year. Never went back to school. When the guy graduated the following year, his friend, he hired him to count his money as an accountant. The guy who started the business, his name was Tom, last name McCann. I wear shoes all the time. He got stores in all the malls, all over America, Tom McCann. The guy saw the people. Now, here's the key. Don't miss the key. Both men saw the same thing. One became rich, the other employed. But they saw the same thing. One saw bare feet, another saw a shoe business. This is a good time to study the Bahamas or America or England, wherever you live. You need to go back home and study and ask God to show you the businesses. This is a time to see beyond your eyes. There's never a time when there's no business going on. Write this down. What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. You are carrying something so awesome and it's God's idea and it's bigger than anything you could get an education for. Study your environment and you will see that there is no crisis. There is only opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. That guy looked at bare feet and saw an opportunity. Don't sit around looking for a job. Create your own job. Don't sit around waiting for someone to employ you, waiting for the government to find some project. You need to start looking at bare feet and see a shoe business. I discovered something about life and this thought hit me yesterday hard. God said this to me yesterday. He said, son, human needs never change. Study human needs. No matter what, what the, the environment is, human need water, they need food, they need clothing, they need security, they need protection, they need preservation. No matter what happens, they need some things. They say that when, when the economy falls apart, three people always have a job. One, the medical field, Two, the counselors, whatever that, that, that is. And three, the undertaker. <laughs> Always got a job. So you, if you're an IT specialist, we might need you right now. So you better start looking at bare feet and see shoe businesses. There ain't no lack of employment in our country. There's lack of sight. Listen to me. 
Hog Island was always Paradise Island. Now, repeat that to me. Whatever you call a thing, that's what it is. Someone came to our country and changed the name. We lived with it. Our government called it Hog Island, so we call it Hog Island too. And on the map, in the Bible, they say Hog Island. I say they put on the map, they put it Hog Island. Another guy came and said, I don't like the name. Let's put it Paradise Island. And now it's Paradise Island. See, what do you see when you look around you? Stop waiting for a job. Create your own job. There ain't no crisis of economy. There's crisis of vision. But you know what? Our pride is so deep. We always want a sophisticated job. We're in a uniform. We're in a suit. And God says, no, go bake cookies. I'm going to give you a global cookies business. But they're going to start in your back trunk. Go bake some cookies. People got to eat. And I got an idea, you know. <laughs> Develop a Bahamian nutritional cookie. You eat one of them, you don't need to eat anything else. <laughs> You're laughing. You're laughing. You need to go and study. Put vitamin C in it, vitamin A in it, vitamin D in it, vitamin in. And you get this cookie and call it Bahama Booba or something, you know. <laughs> eat this cookie. Give your child this cookie. You put, you know, little, little you know, oats and thing in it. Same thing you put in, in conference. In other words, you, you, you dream, you think. People got to eat. Do you know they say that McDonald's and Burger King, this past month, their profits are up one quarter. Why? Because people ain't going to no five-star restaurant. They can't afford it. They're going to get themselves one more time a Big Mac. See, some of y'all got to live from Big Mac until now. I'm going straight from a fast food. Right? I can't afford no $10,000 meal. I need a $4 meal. See? They're making money because they're solving a problem. Your kids want to eat. You used to go to the five-star restaurant, take your kids over to Paradise Island, eat all that food, cost you $200. You can't do that now. You tell them, you're eating McDonald's today. Why? $10. In other words, look for the problems. Because that's your business. People putting off doing major development in their homes now or in their business. They put, they put, they're putting it off. They're, they're delaying it. So if you are a, a, a plumber, you are an electrician, you are a contractor, you better start thinking diversity. Because when construction slows down, you can sit around waiting for a job, something. You got to start being creative. Look at their feet and see a shoe business. Let me close with some, some thoughts here. Write this down. Job versus work. This is for everybody here because this is where we at. Take this back to your country. Number one, never confuse your work with your job. See, here's why. Number two, your job is what you were trained to do. Your work is what you were born to do. Listen carefully. Your job is your career. They can fire you from that. But your work is your life's assignment. They can't fire you from that. Your job is your skill. You were trained for that. But your work is your gift. You were born with that. Your job, you can retire from. But your work, you can never retire from. Because you can't retire from yourself. Oh, do you need this message right now? They can lay you off a job, but they can't lay you off yourself. So when you leave, you take a gift with you. And wherever your gift lands, it starts to grow again. Don't allow people to control your life by you making your job equal to your work. Because you are more than your job. I love to see, you know, I, I, I passed your place the other day, down there on West Bay Street, you know, and I see the vision. We had a dance school. I'm thinking, wow, man, this is creativity. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, work in the day, and at night, don't let your hands be idle. You have to realize that your job and your work are not the same. And your gift is bigger than your skills. 
This is the time to use your skills, to use your gift, to develop. This last statement, jobs prepare you for your work. You use jobs to refine your gift so that when they release you from your job, you got a valuable gift. This is why when a person finds their gift, they have peace. I remember when Moses was fired from his job. Moses used to be a prince. That's a top executive job. He was fired and became a fugitive. He landed in the desert in Midian. Guess what Joseph, Moses did? Moses decided to become a shepherd. He had another job. And in that job, he was training how to organize, lead, deal with the desert, handle to find out where the water is, where the food is for the sheep. He was using that job in preparation for his main work. Because he knew later, God knew his work would then take him from sheep to people. And instead of taking the sheep of the desert, he now had to take people to the desert. He learned the skills of the desert. His job prepared him for his real work. That's why God would release some people from their jobs. Why? He expects your gift to be developed now. You know, we got a young lady here who used to work at Atlantis. And uh, she called her home. She probably didn't know I was listening. And she said, Pastor Miles, Pastor Ruth, you know, I was in that number. And I was thinking, this woman is one of the top pastry chefs in the world. And I'm thinking, boy, what a chance to start a pastry business. Turn your oven into a business. Undersell all the other bakeries. Get yourself a business. Use your gift and turn it around. I tell you about, about my cookie woman, who I saw the other day. Man, she's driving a Rolls Royce now. Woman used to be making beds in a hotel. And I went to Mount Airy, uh, was it Mount Airy? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Thank you, darling. And I went there to speak in a conference, and the place was just like this. And she was a maid in the hotel, making beds. Sitting in the crowd, place was packed. And I taught on potential. Please get those books. Please, I beg you, members, get them. Because that's what got her changed. She read the books. And I spoke on potential for three days. At the end of the last day, the lady came to me. She said, uh, you are speaking tomorrow morning, the last session. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, my name is so-and-so. I work in the hotel, and I'm a, a, a housekeeper. I make beds and so forth. She said, but you touch my gift today. And the next day, she came and she bought me some cookies. She just gave them to me. She said, this is my gift. I went back to the hotel and bit into a cookie. I had an experience. <laughs> I won't tell you how it felt. I mean, I had to take my shoes off and wiggle my toes. That cookie was amazing. I still remember the, the taste of that cookie. She must have had some stuff in that that don't exist on earth. So that evening, the last session, I found her. I said, the lady who bought me the cookies, please come forward. And she came down in the crowd. I said, madam, this is your gift. You're not a hotel worker making beds. You are a cookie maker. You need to take this gift and start serving it. And I gave her instructions. I said, number one, you start baking these cookies and give them away free to all your families and your friends. Just give it away free. It's like drugs. Give the first one free. Come on, clap, 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 clap. Now, this is a true story, and the woman did exactly what I said. I went back to Mount Airy one year to the day, the next year, 12 months. And when I pulled up in the car, the security guys let me out, and all these folks around, you know, want to shake my hand. And this lady walks up, and you should have seen this lady. She had on a beautiful suit, man. She had a nice hat. And she had this bag with all kind of rings and stuff on. It made like a million dollars, man. She came walking into the car, and she and this girl says, uh, "No, man." I said, "Let that lady through, man. She looked rich. Ooh, she looked cool." And she had this bag in her hand, and she said, "Do you remember me?" I said, "No, ma'am." She said, "You don't remember me?" I said, "No, ma'am. I don't remember you." She says, "I'm the lady from last year." 
I said, what lady? She said, I'm the cookie lady. I said, oh my goodness, you have any more cookies? And she gave me this beautiful bag with all a beautiful name on it. Give me this bag. And she's like, I bought you some cookies. And then she sat there and told me a story. I opened the bag. These were cookies packed in cellophane, beautiful label, everything. She says, when you left, I started giving my cookies away. And the cookies began to become in demand. And my family started ordering batches of cookies for their parties and for their events. And the folks who work in the hotel started ordering. She says, and I started making hundreds of cookies every week. And now it's up to three, four hundred every week. She said, today I have a cookie factory. I want to take you to it. I employ 182 people and I am now a multimillionaire. She said, the stores in the city start buying her cookies, putting them in the big stores. One year. So I took the bag, I gave her a kiss. Went back, spoke that night. I had to stand up as a testimony. And then I went back to the hotel room, opened the bag. I couldn't wait to get to the cookies. <laughs> and I opened the cookies, and in the bag was a white envelope. And I opened it, it was $10,000. I was letting know. She said, thank you for tapping into my cookie gift. I said, Lord, I need some more cookie women. Come on, give God a hand for a woman who found that gift. I wonder how many of you making bears when in fact you got a cookie factory. I had a scripture that I want to read for you before we go. It's an important scripture. Write this down. There's no future in any job. The future is in the one who holds the job. Your job is as safe as you are. There ain't no safety in any job. Carry your gift with you. They cannot take your gift away. This woman became unemployable because she found her gift. Wow. From making beds to driving a Rolls Royce because of one session on potential. I wonder what you're sitting on. We ain't got no crisis in our countries. We got a crisis of vision. Jobs are temporary. Work is permanent. She can never be fired again, can she? Write this down. You can fire you can be fired from your job, but never fired from your work. Write this down. You can retire from your job. You can never retire from your work. Write this down. Your work protects you from your job. There's no guarantee what that bank you work for will do next month. You have no idea what they're thinking, what they're planning. You better get in touch with your gift. Just in case they decide to take their job back. It's an important session. You are more powerful than the place you work. They don't know your gift. You're just giving them some time. You are powerful. There's something on the inside that's bigger than your job. And that's why God actually allows crisis to come sometime so you can find your gift. You're an awesome person. Write this down. Your work is your seed. If you plant a seed in Haiti, it'll grow. But what's amazing is the United Nations have calculated that Haiti is the poorest country in the Western world. The seed doesn't care. It still grows. No matter what they say about the economy, your seed will grow. Seeds have no respect for announcements by governments. Hope you all hear what I'm saying. It, it, it doesn't matter what they say. The life of the seed is in the seed, not the announcements. You're going to succeed if you find your seed. And so I put this to you. Everyone possesses a seed of greatness. 
Your seed is your purpose and your passion. Your seed contains your future. And in every seed, there's a forest. That woman was working in a hotel, sleeping on a cookie business worth millions. She was waiting for someone to come along and say, you are more than what you're working. You know what the Bible says about a man of purpose? It says, purposes are like deep waters. And a man of wisdom comes and draws it out. Until they, I'm that man. The purposes are inside of you. They're deep. And every word of God is like a bucket that goes down inside of your spirit and pulls up stuff you never knew you had. That woman didn't know she was a cookie business. There's a store called Lions Supermarket in that city. When I walked into the supermarket, I saw her cookies on the shelf. And every time she sees me, she gives me a check. That's why I keep visiting it, Mount Airy. <laughs> why? The Bible says you should do good to those who fed you. She's a giver now, not a beggar. From her seed. Write this down. Your seed determines your natural talents. And the world is waiting for it. You were born to do something that the world needs. It's not a matter of the economy. They need what you get. And our country needs to get free from this single industry spirit. We are filled with multitudes of great seeds. Clap. Yep. Good place to clap. Your seed is the idea that won't go away. It's the thing you keep thinking about doing. It's what you'd rather be doing. And I like what the Bible, the Bible is a good book. And the Bible says, work in the day. I mean, if you get a job, go to work. It says, but in the evening, don't let your hands be idle. So you do your job in the day and do your work in the night. Do what they tell you to do in the day and then do what God told you to do in the night. It says, because you know not which one will prosper you, either this one or that one. This is why that woman, Cookie Life, is such an example to me. She kept a job and baked the cookies at the same time, until her cookies became bigger than the job. Go home and stir your seed up. You always have what you were born with. I know I'm going a little over time, but I want you to get this, okay? Because I'm going to take a break this week. Write this down. You always have what you were born with. Say it. Can you say it again? Say it to your neighbor. What I'm telling you is so deep. You were not born with a job. And whatever someone give you, they can take back from you. But you always have what you were born with. That leads to number two. You can never lose what you were born with. You were born with your seed. And number three, your future is not ahead of you. It's trapped within you. So it doesn't matter what they say about the environment. Your future is inside of you. And therefore, you were born a seed. And this is why you could say with all your might, the key to your life is discovering, and developing, and releasing your seed. And that's what that woman did with that cookie idea. She had a gift. She developed it, and then she served it. Keep in mind again, give it away free first. Give it away free. There's a lady in our church who, I don't know if she heard this cookie message before, but she said, give me some cookies. And the cookies taste good, you know? And every time I go to office on Sunday morning, there's this box of cookies on my desk. Then my daughter fell in love with them. She came home from school. She started eating the cookies. One day my daughter called me. She says, uh, whoever baked those cookies, can you tell them to bake a batch for me? I said, what you talking about? She said, they're the best cookies. And I, and then I let my friends in Texas use them, and they like them too. And so they want these cookies. So I ended up putting an order in for the cookies to ship to Texas for her to give her friends. I said, tell your friends to give you money to give me money to buy more cookies. <laughs> In other words, a cookie business started from someone just giving me cookies. Can you imagine with your PhD, you say, I ain't baking no cookies. I got a master's degree. 
You better go bake cookies now. <laughs> Your master's degree is broke. Yeah, are you understand me? That's what I mean by the, by the pride piece. Bahamas got this pride thing. Farming in the Bahamas? Are you crazy? I don't farm. I don't farmer. You better go farm. Why? People got to eat. You can't lose with farming. Yeah, write this down. Seeds are never in recession. You ever heard a mango seed saying, well, I can't grow now. <laughs> they say that the stock market fell, I can't grow right now. The seed don't care. Just give me soil and here I come. Oh, this is what I want to close on. This is scripture I want to close on. Oh, this is so important. Write this down. And the Lord said to him, to Moses, what is in your hand? Moses, I want you to do something for me. And Moses started telling God what he didn't have. And that's where we are right now. I don't have this. I don't have that. I ain't got that. God said, look, that's not the question. It's not what you don't have. What do you have in your hand? Moses says, a staff. The Lord says, good, throw it on the ground. We're going to work with what you have. And it was that piece of wood that set a nation free. I wonder what you're carrying in your hand to set people free in your country. To turn the economy around. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 2. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? He said. You remember this woman? She was about to die. Look what she said. She said, Your servant has nothing there at all. Now, that sounds like a Bahamian. But the last part, she pushed in there real quick. Except. Let me tell you something. You always got something except. What's, what is your except? Well, they laid me off. I ain't got nothing. My addition is except. You still got a brain with five billion cells and it's working. Why don't you think about something? Woman says, all I got is this. We're going to die afterwards. He says, what do you have in your house? Everybody say, your house. The stuff is in your house. How many hours your baker ain't working? Turn it into cash. How many hours your sewing machine ain't working? What's in your house? How many hours your computer ain't working? Start a computer business. Sales through computer. Go check your house out. She said, all I have is a little oil. You know, she said, that, that, that's enough. He said, that's enough. He says, bring as many. He said, go to your neighbor and collect as many bottles as possible. And guess what the Bible says? She went and borrowed. She borrowed people's bottles. And she bought them back. You want to hear something real deep? It says that when Elijah told her, Elijah, okay, now pour a little bit of oil you have in the bottles. She bought all these bottles, hundreds of bottles. He said, pour. And every time she pour, the oil wouldn't come out. I mean, the oil wouldn't run out. He said, pour. She poured. And the Bible says, and when she reached to the last bottle, she filled it up, and then the oil stopped. Now, here's the trick. The oil didn't stop because the oil was finished. Hey, boys, they store up for summer. Yeah, you want to get plenty place for God to bless. Think big in the middle of a crisis. There was a famine in the land when he met the woman. Everybody say the land. The land means the country, the, 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 the nation. There was a famine in the land. But there was no famine in the house when a man of God walked in the house. I am the man of God this morning. I walk into your house. Go get your bottles. You are coming through this. You're going to sell oil. The Bible says she began to sell oil to her neighbors who she borrowed the bottles from. 
in the middle of a crisis. What do you have in your house? Turn it into a business. And Jesus had some bread. Jesus said, feed them. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only. Sounds normal. This is all we have. We only have. You never only have. You only see. You always have more than you see. All we have is five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, bring them to me. We got 5,000 people. He said, bring them to me. In other words, what you see is five loaves and two fishes. What I know is a banquet. What do you have? This is all I have. God said, okay, you got cookies? Let's start a factory. In the name of Jesus. May the Lord give us the grace to see a banquet in a row. It's how you see. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.